History of Musical Theatre Podcast, Season 1, Episode 2. Hello and welcome back to the History of Musical Theatre Podcast. I'm Remington Avenue Campbell. Last week I spoke about why I wanted to talk about Oklahoma and some of the myths behind it. I also introduced into your lexicon Bippity Bloop Blips or Bloopity Bloop Blip. Anyway, it was mine, it was my idea, I thought of it first. This week we're going to be taking a tour of the 1920s and 30s. There wasn't any one musical theatre at the time. There were a bunch of different genres which got... close? I've broken them down into four major categories, plus a brief addendum on how we view progress in its historical context. The first genre I'm going to talk about is the oldest and most obvious, but it gives me a good opportunity to talk about what a musical is and isn't, and that is... A play with music. Some romantic operas are called plays with music, but I'm talking about the more literal, exactly what the words sound like they mean definition. A play with music. Plays with music have been around as long as plays have existed. Anyone who's taken a theatre history course might remember how the Greeks use music in their plays. The term orchestra comes from the playing space used in those amphitheatres. Moving forward through theatre history, we see that numerous Shakespeare plays contain songs. A Midsummer Night's Dream and The Tempest have music which comes from magical characters. The Tempest also has some extremely drunken sea shanties. Plays like Much Ado About Nothing and Love's Labour's Lost have characters sing in order to entertain other characters. Even Green Grow the Lilacs, the play on which Oklahoma is based, contained music and dancing. The title of the play itself was actually taken from a Civil War era folk song. The most important difference here between a play with music and a musical is diegetic and non-diegetic music. If you've never heard those terms before, allow me to briefly explain. Diegetic music happens in the world of the story. The characters can hear it and interact with it. They're the ones producing it. Non-diegetic music is more unique to the world of musicals. I have feelings, let me sing them. I say it's unique to the world of musicals, but it isn't really. You find it in opera and in film. In opera, almost all the music is non-diegetic. They're just singing what's happening. If someone did that in real life, you'd think they were crazy. The term is also used in film studies. The score would be non-diegetic music, but a song playing on the radio in someone's car or a character singing a song is diegetic. Examples of this would be films like Baby Driver, in which diegetic music is often used in the place of non-diegetic music. That's a really, really good film. It's like a musical, but no one sings. The film Once, which incidentally has been adapted into a stage musical, also uses a lot of diegetic music. The characters are musicians, and so they play and they sing. Musicals, interestingly, often contain both diegetic and non-diegetic music. Musical theatre classic High School Musical and its esteemed sequels, High School Musical 2 and High School Musical 3 Senior Year, all contain a mixture of diegetic and non-diegetic music. Breaking Free is diegetic. Stick to the Status Quo is non-diegetic. Many Rodgers and Hammerstein shows also use a mixture. In The Sound of Music, for example, songs like Edelweiss and The Lonely Goat Herd are diegetic, whereas 16 Going on 17 and How Do You Solve a Problem Like Maria are non-diegetic. This is now making me imagine what would happen if your peers actually stood around in real life singing a song about how annoying you are. It would be a very unique experience. (laughs) Somewhat tangential, but something that's also common in musical theatre, is that songs sometimes blur the line between diegetic and non-diegetic. How does that work? Well, in acclaimed musical classic, High School Musical, many songs begin non-diegetically with the characters singing them in an audition or a performance, like you would in real life. 
but continue towards being non-diegetic, with production elements which couldn't possibly be happening in the world of the story. The Sound of Music contains a number of songs which could be diegetic or could be non-diegetic depending on your interpretation. Songs like So Long Farewell and Favourite Things. A show like Hades Town, for example, with music and lyrics by Anais Mitchell, exists almost entirely in this in-between space. There are some songs which are explicitly diegetic, Orpheus sings the song he's working on, and it's pretty clear that he's actually singing. But almost any part of the show could be interpreted as diegetic, given the mythological and musical nature of the story. In case I haven't offered enough it's not really clear what category this falls into definitions, I should also point out that some plays contain non-diegetic music and are still not musicals. The music's sung, but by an actor rather than by a character, and it can be imagined more like a film score. Another type of show that contains music but isn't a musical is the review. You may have seen or performed in reviews. The difference is that in the 1930s, reviews were a massive deal. Musical reviews are similar in lots of ways to vaudeville shows, which also existed. They contained a series of standalone acts performed in a program, often multiple times in the day. The history of vaudeville on its own is pretty interesting, and I'm not able to get into it here, but maybe one day. Vaudeville was affordable entertainment, and it actually led a lot of people into careers on Broadway and in film. Judy Garland and Fred Astaire, two examples of this. If you're into your Sondheim shows, you're probably familiar with Gypsy. Gypsy takes as its setting a series of vaudeville theatres across America. That's all I have to say about vaudeville today, because I, what I'm really doing is focusing on its younger, more sophisticated brother. The Musical Review. Last episode, I mentioned Florin Ziegfeld. This is where he comes into his own. He is remembered primarily for his work in musical reviews, notably on the Ziegfeld Follies. The Follies was an annual review, meaning every year this larger-than-life musical spectacular was performed. It started in 1907 and continued until 1931, although the 1926 edition had to take a different name for legal reasons. First, No Fallen, and then... Ziegfeld American Review. The second definitely makes more sense for branding reasons. There are also four editions that took place between 1934 and 1943, after Ziegfeld's death. It was Ziegfeld's wife, Anna Held's, idea to create a musical review in the French style. The review took as its tagline, a national institution glorifying the American girl. It was the Follies that solidified the connection between Broadway and large groups of beautiful leggy chorus girls. A number of musicals use these shows as their setting. Sometimes Follies, Funny Girl, and the Will Rogers Follies are all examples of this. There aren't many similar productions in the modern era. The closest example I could probably give of this would be if you imagine The Rockettes meets Saturday Night Live. To be fair, that sounds really cool. That'd be fun. The Ziegfeld Follies were a spectacular show, and one even featured live elephants. In New York. The shows helped launch the careers of Marilyn Miller, Fanny Bryce, and Will Rogers, but they weren't the only serial musical at the time. The Passing Show had its first edition in 1894, years before Broadway would see the Ziegfeld Follies. It would go on to have 12 editions. There was also the George White Scandals, the Errol Carroll's Vanities, the Greenwich Village Follies, and the Music Box Reviews, each of which performed between 4 and 13 editions. But there are also standalone reviews. One that is going to be very important next episode is the Garrick Gaieties, but there are others. 
1931 saw the premiere of The Bandwagon, which featured Fred and Adele Astaire in their final Broadway performance together. There's also a movie of the same name which came out in 1953. Based on the review, it retained Fred Astaire, replaced Adele with Sid Charisse, and added, shockingly, a plot. There is actually a modern example of this. The film which started the dark times we've all found ourselves living in. Cats. I'm not going to defend the Cats movie, I haven't seen it. But Cats the Musical is a thematic review, like the bandwagon. All the songs are pretty much self-contained and exist to be entertaining rather than to tell a connected story. The Bandwagon was a thematic review, which was rare for the time. The songs were written for the show, and like Cats, they all fit into a similar style. This was unusual for reviews at the time, which were usually a little less coherent. The longest-running show of the decade was also a review, Hell's a Poppin'. It ran over a thousand performances, beginning in 1938. Again, we're not talking about Phantom, we're talking about the 30s. The show included identical twin dancers and Harry Houdini's younger brother. Now for something you might be a little bit more familiar with, although the term itself has fallen out of common usage. The contemporary term for a musical comedy is a musical. Shows in the other genres often get called by their separate names, but the term musical comedy is rarely used except as a synonym for musical theatre. Out of all the various performance genres from which musicals came, musical comedy is definitely the most closely linked. A basic description of a musical comedy is a non-integrated musical. The Rodgers and Hart show On Your Toes falls into this category, as does Cole Porter's Anything Goes. Florence Ziegfeld once commissioned a show from Jerome Kern to act as a star vehicle for Marilyn Miller. What they created was the 1920 musical comedy Sally whose plot is resolved after she wins the heart of the tenor and is signed for the Ziegfeld Follies. Plots of musical comedies were often ridiculous. Despite getting his start in operetta and musical reviews, Cole Porter is pretty much representative of the 1930s and 40s musical comedy. He wrote the aforementioned Anything Goes, as well as Leave It To Me, 50 Million Frenchmen, Gay Divorce, and Jubilee. There is also a long history of taking Cole Porter songs and creating new shows out of them. High Society is an example of this. People also tend to mix and match Cole Porter songs between shows. This is possible because of the non-integrated nature of it. If you tried to mix and match Rodgers and Hammerstein songs between shows, you would have what is technically called a hot mess. If you find yourself in the modern day watching a musical comedy, it's probably a Cole Porter show. Listening to the lyrics of a Cole Porter show, you might notice that they are full of contemporaneous references. This was another main feature of musical comedy, and Cole Porter was one of the worst offenders. It might seem odd to fill your show with seemingly obscure references, especially given how decentralized media has become. But Kruger explains in The Annotated Anything Goes, the audiences for this and other 1930s shows were a constricted group of cognoscenti who went to the same night spots, read the same newspaper columns, and spent weekends at the same estates and were therefore swift to pick up on even the most obscure references in all the lyrics. Did I have to look up both the pronunciation and the definition of cognoscenti? Yes. It is persons who have superior knowledge and understanding of a particular field, especially in the fine arts, literature, and the world of fashion. Thank you, dictionary.com! One of the interesting things about Lorenz Hart is that he didn't do this. His lyrics are more universal. <laughs> A lot of the great innovations of 1920s to 1940s musical theatre comes from operetta. Operetta has fallen out of favour, a trend which actually began during this time. 
The gap left by its declining popularity may have actually been part of the reason that the new integrated musical became so dominant so quickly. I'm talking here about operetta in America. There is a long and rich history of continental European operetta, and this is not the time or the place. Again, maybe one day, but we're going to talk about America now. Operetta is generally sung through, but not always. Is Les Mis an operetta? Hamilton? Hades Town? They're all sung through, but the answer is no. There are two other criteria. Classical music and a connection to the wider operatic tradition. Again, those are more of like a general criteria as opposed to strict rules. The latter is closest to a rule. Music critics were hesitant to award the title of operetta to anyone who didn't come through the world of classical music. Some of the grey area surrounding George Gershwin's Porgy and Bess comes from the fact that he wasn't viewed as part of that world. He didn't have the appropriate credentials. And the score had really strong jazz influences. If you're looking for the pinnacle of comic operetta, I suggest listen to some Gilbert and Sullivan. Pirates of Penzance, Iolanthe, HMS Pinafore, The Mikado. Gilbert and Sullivan wrote a little earlier than the historical period I'm talking about, and they were also British. Musical theatre, at least American musical theatre, has its roots more in American operetta. Before I get into the significant operettas of the time, I need to introduce you to someone. Mr. Hammerstein. Actually, a couple of Mr. Hammersteins. Enough Mr. Hammersteins to play bridge. They were a very musical family. Oscar Hammerstein I was born in 1847 and died in 1919. The Oxford Companion to the American Musical calls him a dapper empresario, which is quite a title. I should put in my will that I want them to call me a dapper empresario on my tombstone. I think that would be, I think that would be good. I'd like that. Throughout his career, Oscar won, built and subsequently lost a number of theatres. Again, that's such a weird achievement. Imagine building a theatre and then losing it and then going... Oh, let's do it again. This guy built and lost five or six theatres. In 1910, he produced Naughty Marietta. The Victory Theatre was the most successful of his ventures. It was a vaudeville house. Though the successes of that were largely due to his son, William Hammerstein. Vaudeville lived and died on the quality of its performance, and William booked many of the Victoria's most popular performances. Oscar Hammerstein I had another son, Arthur Hammerstein. <sighs> We're getting there. I swear by the end of this, Hammerstein isn't going to sound like a word anymore. Arthur is probably the second most successful Hammerstein. Arthur was put in charge of the Hammerstein Enterprise. He produced Firefly in 1912 and gave our final Mr. Hammerstein his start in theatre. Grandson of Oscar Hammerstein I, son of William Hammerstein, and nephew of Arthur Hammerstein, the man you've all been waiting for, Oscar Hammerstein II. Technically, he wasn't properly a second, because it was his grandfather and not his father, and there's rules about those sorts of things, but his grandfather was so prolific in theatre that it made sense to call himself the second to not confuse people. I apologize if you're still confused. That's that's on Oscar. Two, the second one. That's on the second one. Now that I've presented to you this theatrical dynasty, I can continue with the task of presenting significant operettas. 1907 saw the Broadway production of Franz Lear and Adrian Ross's The Merry Widow. This show is a good example of the operetta climate at the beginning of the century. It was based on a French play, which was then adapted into a Viennese opera. The show was then translated and brought to London, and then to New York, where within three months it had a burlesque offshoot because... reasons. It sparked a number of other trends, including Merry Widow hats, and more broadly, 
continental operettas. The 1910 musical Naughty Marietta is set in French New Orleans, and it's about pirates. It's a bit of a Cinderella story, a pretty typical operetta storyline. Peasant girl falls in love with a lieutenant, kidnapping, peasant girl is really a princess. Operettas were not known for their revolutionary plots. The Firefly debuted in 1912. It was produced by Arthur Hammerstein, uncle of our main man, composed by Rudolf Frimmel, and had a libretto by Otto Harbach. It was the show which introduced Frimmel to Broadway. Arthur would eventually produce a total of ten of Frimmel's operettas, which is a lot. I will be getting into much more detail about Oscar Hammerstein in the second's life in a later episode, but I just want to recount to you one incident which happened. Arthur Hammerstein sent him, along with Otto Harbach, to Quebec to investigate an ice festival. So it turns out that the ice festival didn't exist. But the trip wasn't wasted as the pair ended up writing the show Rosemary. It was unique in the world of opera as it didn't take a mystical far-off world as its setting, it took Canada. It also didn't focus on the lives of the rich and powerful. Its leading man and leading lady were a fur trapper and a singer, respectively. Another novelty was that the plot involved murder, something which usually would be reserved for the grand opera. If you didn't listen to the last episode, you probably should because this show is kind of linear. But also because I discussed two more operettas in it which were hugely significant, Showboat and Porgy and Bess. Both are acclaimed operettas, or operas, or light operas, or musicals, or something. It's complicated. It's in the last episode. Another interesting change that was happening in the theatre at the time was the combination of some slow desegregation and an increase in black theatre. The Ballet Theatre, the US's first professional ballet company, had what they called their Negro unit, which consisted of 14 dancers. Their goal to create a truly American ballet company involved African American dancers, despite being segregated. Oklahoma choreographer Agnes DeMille actually created a ballet for the Negro unit in its first season. It feels a bit icky to say, but that's what they called it. Something interesting happened on Wild Theatre Day, which was just a couple of days before I recorded this episode. Performer and choreographer Michael Callahan asked on his Instagram which shows people would like to see reworked for the 21st century and which shows should be retired altogether. Both Showboat and Porgy and Bess made an appearance in the Shows We Should Ditch category. It turns out specific genre classifications is not the only controversy these shows carry with them. The other is more serious. Both shows had entirely or majority black casts, but white production teams. There are accusations that they traffic in stereotypes. This isn't the place for me to have that discussion. If I can say anything about this episode, it's that it's not the place for a lot of discussions. Is this the third one? This is the third thing it's not the place for. But given the Broadway climate at the time, I think it's pretty interesting that two of the most successful shows of the decade were majority black. It reminds me of some comments that Lin-Manuel Miranda made about West Side Story and an article I read from a cast. It reminds me of the comments made by Lin-Manuel Miranda talking about West Side Story and an article I read by a woman in the cast of Book of Mormon. Both of these echoed similar sentiments. Lin-Manuel Miranda said something to the effect of it gave a lot of Latino performers their equity cards and it reinforced the connection in people's minds between Latinos and gangs. I haven't been able to find the other article. If someone knows where it is, I would love to be able to credit the author properly. Book of Mormon has been criticised for its portrayal of Uganda, but the author of the piece wrote about the way in which the show was unlike any other cast she'd ever been in that members of stage management would just babysit, and that other women in the cast gave her secondhand things so she didn't have to buy stuff when she had her new baby and went on maternity leave. She said that all in all it was the most supportive cast she'd ever been. 
looking at the major productions of Miss Saigon has also given me a similar feeling. The show has problems, and I'm not going to deny that, but both Leah Salonga and Eva Noble Azada have gone on to have very successful musical theatre careers after performing the role of Kim. Leah went on to be in Les Mis and to become an actual Disney princess, and Eva created the role of Eurydice in Hades Town on Broadway, which is a super successful show. This is all to say that shows can have complicated legacies. All five of the shows I just talked about do. They were all also successful shows that probably did a lot of good for the people in them. I think there can be room for both critique of shows and acknowledgement of the good that they might have done for certain people in a certain time and place. The musical landscape of the 1920s and 30s was different from contemporary musical theatre in a lot of ways. The types of shows, the types of audiences, but it was still fundamentally about telling stories to people and entertaining them with music. Next week, I'll be introducing you more fully to Mr. Richard Rogers. Fortunately, not part of a theatrical dynasty. He's the man behind all the musical interludes you've been hearing. You'll also find out the best place to have a heart attack. I'm not kidding. Until then, I hope you have oh such a wonderful day. Bye.